And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there, and there's all kind of stuff around. And um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey, and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years' experience as an award winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. Just last week, it was announced that OJ Simpson has passed away. The news of his death has received mixed reactions from people all over the world. OJ was a successful football player, actor, and TV personality, but those are probably not the things he'll be most remembered for. The thing he'll most likely be remembered for is one of the most controversial and talked about trials of the last century. In 1994, OJ was tried, then acquitted, for the murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. In this video, we're going to look at an interview that he did that was kept secret for over a decade, in which he talked about this bizarre hypothetical scenario of what it would have been like if he had actually committed these murders. We're gonna look at body language, facial expressions, and word choice to try to determine just how hypothetical this story is in one of the strangest interviews I've ever witnessed. Okay, now before we look at this footage, let me give you guys a bit of context as to what this interview actually is. So in 2006, that's 11 years after he was acquitted, OJ wrote a book called If I Did It. Now it's not exactly very clear just how involved OJ was in the actual content of this book. The ghostwriter of the book says that he was extremely involved and that they had a lot of discussions about what went into the book. However, OJ's manager claimed that he was just given a large sum of money to allow them to use his name and he agreed to do an interview, but that a lot of what's in the book are not OJ's words. What we do know is that in chapter six, there's a hypothetical story of what it would have been like if OJ were the one who committed this crime. So in the book it's saying, if I did it, which is the title of the book, here's what it would have been like. Around the time that the book was going to be published, OJ sat down for an interview with the publisher, Judith Regan, and that was supposed to air on Fox. But following a lot of public objection to both the book and the special, both were canceled and didn't see the light of day at that time. More than a decade after all that, Fox finally released the full interview with commentary by the interviewer and other individuals who were involved in the trial and they called the special O.J. Simpson, The Lost Confession. And that's the interview that we're looking at today. Now there's a challenge associated with the specific interview and it's the following. In most of my analysis videos, I try to stay as objective as I possibly can. This is something that's hardwired into us when we study behavioral analysis, because if you go into an interview or interrogation with a bias, you've already made up your mind, then it affects your ability to think critically and your analysis becomes useless. And although I've slipped up here and there, I think I do a pretty good job most of the time. In fact, the comments on the channel reflect that. However, given this particular case, I think it would be difficult for anyone to argue that there isn't bias here. I don't even know if it's bias, actually. I have nothing personal against OJ. It's not like I dislike him as an actor or a football player, but given the trial, given the evidence, given the behaviors, given the circus that this trial became, I have for a long time believed that he probably had something to do with these crimes. And I think we all have our opinion, so this is going to be a really interesting exercise. Let's try our best to put those aside and just look at these behaviors and say, don't know who this guy is, what are we seeing here in terms of behavior, and what do we think that indicates? With that mindset, let's take it from the top. You write about the night in 1984 with the baseball bat. You know, I don't know why this has become such a big deal. This is what bothered me with the media and these, these uh, stories is, is uh, I hadn't committed to, um, to a, uh, a wedding date. I think I committed to, I gotten engaged, but then I'm gonna do what most guys do, you know. <laughs> you put it off. <laughs> I'm telling well, we'll get married maybe next summer or something. And I had come, she had come home and we were talking about it and we went out front like we often did. And, we was talking about what it was, and I was sitting on the front of this, it was actually my car, but I had bought it for her. And I had a bat between my legs, and as we're talking, I'm, it's, you know, the, it's bouncing off the tire, and we're just talking, and at one point, I hit, it hits the uh, rim, 
And she says, if you damage that, you're going to have to pay for it. And I go, well, if I pay for that, I guess I have to pay for this, too. And I kind of hit the front of her car, you know. So she went in the house. I don't know what she did when she went in the house. But, I mean, it's my car. I pay for everything. So I pay for everything around here, right? She knew he had a volatile temper. All right, so I wanted to start with that clip where OJ is telling a story about a completely different incident to give us a chance to baseline his behaviors, but also the type of person that we're dealing with. So in terms of behavior, there's a couple of really interesting things we're seeing in that clip. Let's start with something that regular viewers know I pay a lot of attention to, and that is the eyebrows. There's a lot of research on what we call the eyebrow flash. That's when the eyebrows go up conversationally. And I'll leave some links in the description to where you can learn a lot more about this. But we know that basically it comes down to the fact that we use our eyebrows to give importance to things. I kind of call it the exclamation point of the face. So we use it to emphasize something, we use it in greetings, but we also use it when we're surprised. But basically it's, there's something important going on. Now OG is really interesting because there are stretches of this interview where those eyebrows come to life a lot. So he's trying to give a lot of importance to things. And there are times where they don't move that much, but we see those eyebrow flashes here and there. And in this segment, they were pretty steady, but we got a nice big eyebrow flash when he was talking about the car. Because as he was talking about the car, he corrected himself and he said, it was actually my car, but I bought it for her. And we see that eyebrow flash, and at the same time, we see the eyes flutter like this. That's where we blink rapidly in succession. Now you'll notice in the way he says it, he's talking about the car and he kind of interrupts himself and his pitch goes up as he does that flutter and eyebrow flash to say, it was actually my car, but I bought it for her. It's important for him to say that there and he's emphasizing with those eyebrows. Sitting on the front of this, is actually my car, but I bought it for her. The research on eye flutters tells us that it happens when we're processing information, when our brain is working overtime. So it, we see it there in that stumble where he kind of catches himself to make sure and put this piece of information in there. And it's weird because the sentence doesn't make too much sense. He says, it was actually my car, but I bought it for her. Well, if you bought it for her, then it's not your car. So the behaviors here suggest that it's really important for him to insert this idea that this was his car, even if he undoes it a second later by saying that he bought it for her. But it also indicates that he might be missing the point as to why people and the media were concerned about this. It's not about whose car it is. People wouldn't be like, oh, oh, it was your car. Okay, then that's totally fine. People are concerned about the aggressive, angry behavior, irrelevant of whose car it is. Another thing you'll notice with his baseline is that when he's recalling, and this happens throughout the entire interview, his eyes dance around all over the place. He might recall a little bit up here, a little bit there. Sometimes he's looking down here as he's trying to remember what happened. Sometimes he's looking straight ahead or a little bit to the side. And there isn't an obvious discernible pattern as to somewhere that he always goes when he's recalling. So the reason I'm saying this is because we're gonna look at a clip later of him giving the hypothetical story. And what I wanna avoid is people going, oh, he's looking up into the left, he's making that up. There are a lot of rumors out there as to where our eyes go when we're being truthful or when we're making things up. Please believe me, not because of my degrees, but because of the fact that as a mentalist, I literally have spent tens of thousands of hours staring at people while they make things up or while they recall real things. There is no pattern. We don't all do the same thing. Now, some people are consistent. Like this one person often looks up as they're trying to remember something. And if they break that baseline, we can ask some questions. But with OJ, there isn't a discernible pattern. He's all over the place with the eyes. I wanna baseline his personality or style of communication a little bit. So in the beginning, you'll notice he said um, he got engaged, but then he did what most guys do. You know, maybe we'll get married next summer or you know, didn't commit to a date. And he's gonna do this a lot throughout the interview to where he tries to normalize behavior with what I call ambiguous social proof, to say anybody would do this, everybody does this, to try to normalize the way he behaves. Now in this case, it really doesn't bother me because he's saying that in his experience with the whole wedding thing, this is what a lot of guys tend to do. Where it's gonna start being a concern is where he uses the same kind of language to normalize behavior that isn't that common. So here we're starting to see a pattern but it's not concerning yet, it's going to be. There is something really interesting in the way that he's telling the story about the baseball bat and the car. In her best-selling book, Lie Spotting, Proven Techniques to Detect Deception, Pamela Meyer has a really, really great segment on the structure of story when someone is telling the truth versus when they're being deceptive. Now, of course, nothing is an absolute because we don't all lie the same way. There are just certain patterns that might indicate that something might be going on and makes us pay a little bit more attention to certain things. And in this case, we see a really good one. 
in most cases, someone who's telling you the truth isn't going to shy away from the detail of what you're asking about, right? They're going to give you a little bit of a setup, then they're going to spend some time explaining what happened, and then you're even going to get a bit of an epilogue, an afterthought, what they thought after the event. With deception, however, they want to spend as little time as possible on that thing that they're being deceptive about. So they might give you this big setup because they can be truthful here, then skim over this and then get to the end and kind of try to move along from it as fast as they can. Now again, remember, nothing is an absolute, but this does correlate to the fact that we know truth tellers often tell, liars often sell. So there's this big sales pitch that leads up to the main event, whereas someone who's telling you the truth doesn't really need that sales pitch. They're just telling you stuff. Now in this case, notice how OJ spends a ton of time on the setup right? He was being asked about an incident with the bat in the car. What happened that day? So he's talking about how they were engaged and wedding this and all that stuff, whereas he could have simply said, we were just talking about the wedding or our wedding plans. But get all this context. Then we get a very vivid picture of him bouncing that bat on the tire. So a lot of setup there. Then when he gets to the main event, the one that people were talking about, the one that she's asking about, which is him smashing the car with his bat, we get one sentence. He goes, well, if I'm going to have to pay for that, I'm going to have to pay for this too. And I hit the front of the car with the bat. And we kind of have this softer tone. He's just kind of grazing over that. And I go, well, if I pay for that, I guess I have to pay for this too. And I kind of hit the front of her car, you know. So she went in the house. I don't know what she did when she went in the house. But, I mean, it's my car. I pay for everything. So I pay for everything around here, right? Then he immediately goes to how she ran inside. And I don't know what she did when she went inside. So who cares what she did when she went inside? Nobody was asking you what she did when she went inside. The question wasn't, hey, talk to us about that time where you smashed the car with your baseball bat. We want to know what she did after she went in the house. It's also interesting the way he's delivering what he said as he was smashing the front of the car. Because he said, well, if I have to pay for that, I guess I have to pay for this too. And I kind of hit the front of the car. Kind of in this throwaway light way. Now, later, we're going to hear recordings of his tone when they're arguing. Suffice it to say, it's really not that. This kind of tone he has here of like casual, well, oh, I guess I'll have to pay for this too. And I think even intuitively, like put yourself in this scenario, right? Where a guy is smashing the front of a car with a baseball bat. I think we can all intuitively know that that was not the tone at all. So we're seeing him here again, using his words to minimize what was going on. And this is something he does a lot. So it's like, yeah, it wasn't a big deal. It's my car anyways. And we're just having a conversation. Oh, well, if I have to pay for that, I have to pay for this too. But, I'm, and that, but that's not, like if we think about it, that's not the way that would have likely played out. And what's really interesting here is the interviewer, Judith, because the camera cuts to her and we're not seeing her connect or agree. We're just seeing her acknowledge. She's barely moving. She's staring at him like this. It's a very cold stare and she's kind of just barely moving, just kind of taking in what he's saying, but there isn't any part of her going, yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah, the people are people, people shouldn't have said all that. You're totally right. She's most likely thinking, yeah, that's still a big deal. Even the way you just described it now with all his attempts to minimize, that's still a big deal. I mean, you still took a bat and smashed the front of a car. Yours, hers, doesn't matter over an argument that you guys were having. So I really don't think he's connecting with her in the way that he thinks he is. But the main thing about this first clip that I want you to keep in mind as we move forward with these other clips is that we have a man here who minimizes his behavior, not out of guilt, like a lot of people, but out of ego. In his head, he's a good person. He's not violent. So whenever he's behaved in that way, it's justified that a good man would do those things. So when we hear minimizing things, it's to fit those behaviors into the behaviors of a good nonviolent person because he doesn't want to challenge that vision that he has of himself. So with that in mind, some baseline behaviors, an idea of the type of person that we're dealing with, and an interviewer who doesn't seem to be sympathizing enormously with what's being said, let's move forward and see where this interview goes. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. Also, I mentioned this last week, but as a reminder, if you're in or around my area, which is Montreal, on April 27th, I have a public show just 15 minutes away from downtown Montreal. This is my award-winning mentalism show. It's a lot of fun. Tickets are almost sold out, but there's still a couple of good seats left. So grab your tickets, come check it out, come say hi after the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green. He's back. Hey, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. Wait a minute, we're sending the police. What is he doing? Is he threatening you? <laughs> going nuts. O.J. had heard a rumor that sent him into a jealous rage. 
that Nicole had been hosting parties where there were drugs and group sex. If she was being influenced by drugs or anything, maybe she might have been making the wrong decision. I just know I didn't want any of these people around my kids. Okay, I wanted to stop this clip short for two reasons. The first is that we're seeing some really interesting behaviors in his face right there that I want to talk about. And one of the things we're seeing is when he talks about any of these people around my kids, we're seeing a great example of conversational contempt. So contempt is usually something that we see displayed on someone's face as a reaction to someone, but here we saw it mid-conversation. Contempt is one of the universal facial expressions. In other words, the research has shown that it looks more or less the same pretty much anywhere in the world, and people recognize it as meaning the same thing pretty much anywhere in the world. And it's usually a scrunching on one side of the face. So it could be like this or like this, and it usually causes a line on one side. Sometimes when it's intense, we even see one of the eyes squint. And we often even see this kind of side eye, what we call looking askance. So in that moment when he said that he didn't want any of these people around his kids, we see that right side of the face scrunch, we see the line on the one side of the face, but either way, you don't need me to tell you that in that moment, all these years later, he's still feeling contemptuous towards these people that she was hanging out with. Contempt means looking down on someone or judging someone, so we feel it in that moment. You barely need me to point that out. But immediately after the contempt, we see that expression relax as he goes into a head tilt, and we see as he's looking at the interview as he's saying this, his eyes soften up and we even see the eyebrows go up a little bit like this. And that's such a great example of the eyebrow flash for social approval. We often say that with the eyebrow flash, we try to get social approval from people. That's such a good example, especially with that head tilt. Because often we head tilt to give or receive sympathy, right? It's a very vulnerable part of the body, so we expose it to try to get some sympathy. So it's almost in that moment he's going, I don't want any of these people around my kids. Please understand. Can you understand? He's trying to get that sympathy from her. I just know I didn't want any of these people around my kids. The second reason I wanted to cut that short clip is actually a trigger warning. So. We're about to go into the phone call to the police where we're going to hear a very stressful situation. He's yelling, she's scared. So if you've experienced anything along these lines in your life or a loved one has and it's something that you don't want to deal with, I'll put a timestamp on the screen right now. Just look at that timestamp at the bottom. If you skip to that time on this video, you will have passed any discussion about the police phone call. Doing that 911 tape that everybody hears me yelling, I'm saying I don't want these girls around my kids. And that's the only thing that argument on that 911 tape was about. I went to her house and I read her about riot act. What did she say? I did what any father and, and would do. <laughs> and yet, you know, if people listen to that tape and made me this horrible person. Whenever they hear that 911 tape, can you believe he's yelling at her about this? Well, when the cops came, it became apparent. She said, I was yelling to her about this and only this. That's the only reason I was there, reading her the riot act, is I don't want these people around my kids. He doesn't say to you, Judith, what really happened, which is he kicks in the door. He, he breaks down the door to get inside the house, and all the yelling that we hear on that 911 tape is because he's pushed himself into a house that is not his and gotten access. That I hit the door, and I was curious. I felt like you almost gave him an out to say knocked. I feel that he hangs himself on every word. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to sit there, ask him a question, not appear to be judgmental, and the way he describes it gives it away. Were you worried, Judith, that, that if you push back, he might just get up and go? Oh, he wanted to go. He wanted to go, and he would have left, and they, he would not have opened up. And he started actually showing his true colors. Have you seen... Okay, so that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Minimizing for ego. So in his head, he's a good, nonviolent person. This was completely justified because he was expressing to her that he didn't want these people that she's hanging out with around his kids. So he's focusing on the content of the message, but not the delivery. It's almost like he's blind to the delivery. He's even saying, I did what any father would do. So this indicates once again, that he's focusing on the fact that any father would say, I don't want my kids around people like this. But I don't think you can make the argument that any father would kick down the door 
come in yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs, talk about who she was having intimate relationships with in the living room, which is something that, by the way, he saw when he came around her house and saw that through the window. So now he's bringing that up that, you know, oh, you were doing such and such in the living room in an aggressive tone using rude language. Like there isn't even an attempt at accountability. You know, sometimes we get people who say, yeah, I really shouldn't have done that and then give you justifications and excuses. And even then you go, okay, so you're defending it a little too much for me. But here there isn't even a little bit of him going, yeah, look, I, w I was really in a rage. I shouldn't have yelled that way, but here's why. We're only getting the but here's why part and, and he has this attitude of like, yeah, no, it's totally acceptable. Any father would have done exactly that, exactly that way, kicking doors down and stuff. Oh, and that's another thing, by the way, we have the social proof coming back here, but earlier I said it's okay if he's saying something like, you know, every guy out there postpones their wedding, but here he's saying, I just did what every father would do. Again, he's trying to justify his behavior by saying, you know, a lot of people would do this, but no, that's, that's simply not true. At the end, there's an interesting little cluster of behaviors as he says, I didn't want these people around my kids. So two things. First, when he says, I didn't want eyebrow flash. Again, remember, importance. I didn't want. Doesn't matter what she wants. What I want is important. I didn't want these people around my kids. Then we see a mouth shrug and the eyebrows go up at the same time. So the eyebrows often do get combined with shrugs. So whether the hands, shoulders, mouth, those eyebrows often go up as well. And very often we see shrugs that we call epistemic shrugs, which is basically, that's everything I have to say about that. There's nothing to add. So it's almost like he's saying, I didn't want these people around my kids. That's that. It's final. Nothing else to say. End of story. I also have that clip at the end of the interviewer commenting on this. And I actually got that clip from elsewhere in the interview, but I combined it to this because what she's saying is really, really important. And this is, by the way, the woman who came the closest to getting an on-camera confession from OJ Simpson, which we're about to see in the next clip, but listen to what she's saying. She's saying, all I had to do is sit there and not appear to be judgmental. I can't emphasize that and applaud her enough for that. I have a video on the channel where I talk about proven ways to get people to open up to you. Things that you can do in everyday interactions that will dramatically increase the odds of someone being willing to tell you the truth. And one of the things we talk about, literally, word for word, is non-judgmental. We've seen so many interviews on the channel lately where somebody comes in with a confrontational attitude trying to grill someone and we've seen how that closes someone up. She's doing the opposite. We could see right from the beginning that she doesn't agree with him. We could tell from her commentary on the special that she doesn't particularly like him. But in that interview, she's trying to not show that. Don't judge him, don't grill him, don't go on the attack, it'll just close him up. Just sit there, non-judgmentally, and let him open up. And that brings us to the part of this interview that is just so bizarre. The hypothetical story of how he would have done it. Now, typically on the channel, I play, you know, 30 to 60 second clips, then we analyze, then we keep going. I want you to see this whole thing in one big chunk, and then I'll just comment on all of it, because I want you to experience this story without being cut off. Here it is, the hypothetical story of how he would have done it. The chapter, Chapter six is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> and let's just walk yeah. through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to. Uh, um, you know, some, uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, uh, Charlie uh, pulls out. Charlie. <laughs> uh, this guy, Charlie, shows up, the guy who I'd recently become friends with, and uh, I don't know why you had been by Nicole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going over there has got to stop, right? So we kind of hooked up together, and uh, you know I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over, get into Bronco and go over. Let, let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? Do the details. You park in, in the, the hypothetical in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And. Um, you reached under the seat for? 
um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the hot car for the crazies and stuff, because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. And I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So the back gate, you go through the back gate. Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. OK. I go to the front, and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, and I can see that it appears, like Nicole had, fly, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on. And uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, a, a, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And, uh, and I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and uh, he was I don't know if I believed it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know, uh, I was more concerned about everything that, that, everything that was going on, you know, and uh, was you know, fed up with it, I guess. And uh, You get into a fight. Nicole comes out. And a verbal, a verbal A verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud, and by that time, uh, uh, Nicole had come out. And we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes, and uh, which I didn't like, because once again, this is the same person. And if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating, you know. Uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, wanted to make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there, and there's all kind of stuff around, and, um, um... What kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we, you know, I hate to say this, but this is hypothetical. I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. That's <laughs> okay. Know? I'm going to back this up. this is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, I know. You know. I'm going to back up to... It's hard to try to make people think that I'm a... I know. I know. I know. <laughs> um, you wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. Covered, you're covered, the scene. Can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it, I'm telling you. I don't think any two people could be um, murdered the way they were without everybody being covered in blood. Okay, what? Seriously, what just happened? Like, forget behavioral analysis for a second. Just purely intuitively. Let me know in the comments, because I feel like I'm going crazy. Do we feel like that was a hypothetical or that we were being told a story that actually happened? Like, I don't know if it's because I've spent an enormous amount of time staring at people tell real stories and staring at people who are telling hypothetical stories and there's something that I'm picking up on, but I feel like most people would look at that and go, that's not hypothetical. Let's, let's look at why I think that. Okay, so right when she brings up the topic, we see a postural shift. His fingers interlace like this and go down to where the organs are. And this is an area that we're very protective over because we know how vulnerable this area of the body is and we get defensive, we tend to block that. Now, I don't mean to say that anytime someone's sitting in that position, it means they're being defensive. But when we see a sudden shift into that position, it might be something to look into. Notice how often he emphasizes and re-emphasizes that this is hypothetical. When she first brings it up, he goes, purely hypothetical, cuts her off, yes, hypothetical. And then throughout the story, hypothetically this and hypothetical that. And is this an indication of guilt? Not really. At this point, he knows that a lot of people don't believe him. So even somebody who didn't actually do this and is giving a hypothetical scenario might feel the need to constantly remind people, now remember, this is hypothetical. But my question about this is, why? why? Why does this exist? Why are you giving us this hypothetical of what it would have been like if you did it? I just find that so bizarre. Right in the beginning, we see an amazing little cluster of behaviors. So when she says, why don't you walk me through what happened on June 12th, 
we see him really looking off to the right like this. Now, up until this point, we haven't seen this often. Yeah, he glanced off to the sides like this, but he is really looking off in the distance here. And this is likely to be something we call exit checking. When, we're, when something is flustering us, when we want to get out of there, we start devising an exit strategy. And I think what we're seeing here is the fight or flight response. So there's a lot of different names for it, you know, fight, flight, or freeze fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, a lot of different people call it different things. But in this case, it is fight or flight, or to be more specific, flight then fight. So I think at first he's looking for an exit, like I need to get the hell out of here. Then he realizes he can't do that because he committed to this interview, so he has to answer this question. So what do we see? We see a nervous laughter, <laughs> which he's doing a lot in this interview, and we see him lean forward head on. 12th, 1994, <laughs> and let's just walk yeah. through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. And what's this man's history? He's a football player. How do football players get ready? They lean forward and get ready for the game. We're seeing him assume that position. So I think he went from flight to fight. Then we hear a line that's like, hey, because he goes, this is really difficult for me because it's hypothetical. Like what? This is difficult for you because it's hypothetical. This should be difficult for you because you're talking about murdering your ex-wife who was actually murdered. And you're walking us through what that would have been like if it was you. Like, what? why is the difficulty of this that it's hypothetical? I just feel like he was saying, this is difficult for me, and then felt the need to just throw in once more that this is hypothetical, but it just doesn't make sense. And then the line that made me go, come on, come on. Because she goes, so then you went through the back gate, and he goes, yes. And she adds to that, and she goes, okay, and it was, it was open or broken. And we see his eyes go up and down and squint, and he goes, I don't recall. You go through the back gate? Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. Okay. Now, I'm gonna play devil's advocate massively here in saying that what he means in I don't recall is, I don't recall in the book, in the hypothetical scenario, if we said that the door was open or broken. That's the thing he doesn't recall. But I think it's severely more likely that in this case, he actually lost himself in the conversation and he's saying he doesn't recall if the door was actually open or broken or what the deal was. And I think she's really clever about this because she breaks down the question. She goes, like she kind of leads him down this path of answering questions and going, so he went through the back door. Yeah, okay, and was it open? So she's kind of got him answering these questions and I think she just caught him off guard. I think that's exactly what happened there because Otherwise, Mr. making it very clear that everything is hypothetical, that's the place where he would have made sure we get that. He would have said, yeah, listen, again, this is hypothetical and I don't remember what we said in the book, but I don't remember if we said it was open or broken. He literally, we see him searching for it. This is what he does when he's searching. His eyes are dancing around and he goes, I don't recall. Does anyone, please, anyone watching that feel like he meant anything other than I don't recall if that door was actually open or unlocked on that day, not hypothetically. Does anyone feel like there's a possibility of that? There's a behavior we're seeing here very often, and it looks a lot like something we talked about, but not exactly the same. So I went back and forth as to what we're seeing here. And it happens when he's talking about Ron Goldman, and he says, um, I saw someone I really didn't recognize. Um, I may have seen him around. And we see this very quick, one-sided kind of like blink as he's saying that. A, a guy that I really didn't recognize, I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him. It's not that same obvious scrunching on the one side that we saw earlier when he was talking about those people at the house. So listen, is it a quick contempt about Ron Goldman? Like what was he doing at my ex-wife's house? It's possible, but it also has a bit of an element of confusion. Like, I don't know, I don't know if I've seen him before. I do that a lot. You may have noticed in my videos, in moments of confusion, I kind of scrunch a little. It's not that heavy contempt, but I kind of like, I don't know what's going on. So it could be a little bit of that with that wink. I'm gonna go back and forth as we move along. Then as he's talking about, if you read the book, there are things that happened in the last two weeks that led up to this that were irritating. We see it again. It's again, it's again just this blink with a quick kind of very subtle scrunch on one side. If you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating. So I was like, okay, it is contempt. It's just subtle contempt because he's literally saying things that happened that were irritating. So that's contempt. But after that, he says, I just remember. And in that moment, as he's trying to remember something, we see it again. Uh, I just remember the coal fell. And in that moment, I don't think there's contempt. So. 
Listen, I think this happens to him in both instances. I think when he's feeling contemptuous, we kind of see his quick one-sided blink. But also, occasionally, he's trying to remember, he's trying to think back. He does a lot with the eyes, and I think that might be one of them. So, back and forth. When it comes to Ron Goldman, unfortunately, I can't tell if it was contempt towards this guy, or if it was like, I don't know, maybe I've seen him before. It could be either one. Another issue I'm having is the verb tense that he's using, right? The whole thing, almost the whole time. I remember, Nicole fell. The guy got into this karate thing. I said, I'm standing there, all kinds of stuff around. I'm standing, I did, I said. It's not, I would have, she would have, he might have. That's hypothetical, right? If I'm telling you a hypothetical situation, I go, I may have shown up, I would have gone in, you know, I would have knocked on the door, I would have heard something, she would have come out, he may have started doing karate. He's not saying that. He's talking with the verbs of someone who's actually recalling something. And then he says, I do remember that portion, taking the knife. And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. What do you mean you remember that portion? Again, unless he means he remembers that portion of the book and, and, and it's very badly expressed because he would say, I remember that part of the book where, where you know, I would have taken the knife. But he's going, I remember that portion, I, taking the knife. Like you're saying you remember taking the knife. And look at his gestures, right? He's going, um, and this guy gets at this karate thing and like he does this with his hands. And I remember taking the knife. Like this is so much more consistent with someone actually reliving these actions, not reading it in a book. Because if you read something in a book, especially because he had a ghostwriter, so you know, these would have been things that he co-wrote, but somebody else did the writing, he would think more like, Okay, and then, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then, and then we said this, and then that would have happened. But here it's, this is visual recall. We see the gestures. We see, I remember grabbing the knife. Look, I don't really understand what's going on here. I'm honestly begging the viewers for someone to, to tell me something in the comments that'll make me go, oh, okay, yeah, okay, no, no, yeah, okay, this is completely hypothetical. Because behaviorally and everything in my experience, as a behavioral analyst, as someone who studied this academically, and as someone who does this on stage all the time, I really feel like this is a story of something that happened, not someone recounting something that was written in a book. And one more thing, he's laughing at the end, and he's laughing throughout, and he's laughing throughout this whole interview. Listen, at the very least, you're talking about your ex-wife who was murdered. You know what I mean? Like, what you're saying here, even if it's hypothetical, that you were the one who did it, it's very similar to something that was actually done. I don't understand how he could be telling this story and, and, and laughing and, and giggling and kind of like casually telling certain bits and parts. If I had to right now tell you a hypothetical story of one of my exes or my current partner being brutally this, this happening, I wouldn't be able to laugh through that, even if it hasn't happened. In this case, take that, add to it the fact that it has happened. She was murdered, how he could be laughing, and even just giving this hypothetical scenario in the first place, I'm beyond words. I don't, I don't get it. And what goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, what happened? Right. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie. Uh, you know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a glove there and blacking out. Have you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No. Of course, you... uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your, your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Okay, now I feel like we're just being laughed at. I feel like he's just laughing at us and going, this is absolutely my confession, but you can't do anything about it. Because she asks about the glove. You know, do you, do you remember taking the glove off? And he goes, I have no conscious memory of that, but I must have because they found a glove. Well, we're not hypothetical anymore. Now he's talking about, because they actually found a glove, right? The, the investigators who got there found a glove. It was a big part of the trial. So we're no longer hypothetical. You're talking about something that actually happened. I'm so confused. How is this hypothetical when you're saying, well, they found a glove, so I must have taken it off. That's not hypothetical. There's something else that he said that, that really caught my attention. And it's when he said, if this were to happen to anybody, I would imagine you would have a hard time wrapping your head around it. And the reason that caught my attention is because this is what he does. We were talking about this earlier, right? When he goes, 
I'm just doing what every guy does when they get engaged. Or I was just doing what every other father would do. He often justifies his own actual behaviors, not hypothetical, his own actual behaviors by, well, this is what this would happen to anyone. It's a way for him to normalize what he's experienced. And then in the beginning and at the end, we have this, it's really hard for me to describe. And at the end he goes, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. And again, it just doesn't feel hypothetical. I'm tired of saying it. It doesn't sound like he's saying, you know, the way we described it in the book, that, that you know, the way that I would imagine that, that would be horrible. He's going, it was horrible. It's hard for me to describe. It really feels like he's talking about something that's real, not a book, not a hypothetical. Early the next morning, OJ was awakened in his Chicago hotel room by a call from the LAPD. When did you cut your finger? Um, to my knowledge, really, when I got the call the next morning, and this is the truth, um, when I got the call the next morning saying um, that Nicole had been murdered, I mean, was killed, was dead. And I kept saying, what do you mean dead, uh, killed, or whatever the words they use? I said, what do you mean? And as well, we can't tell you anything. Uh, we're still investigating, but where are you? And when can you get back here? And, and I think I actually went in the bathroom and it was dawning on me. I was, I didn't really throw a glass. I just was, you know, you, 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 and when I was putting it down, I just, it just smashed, <laughs> you know? And then when he talks about the cut finger, he says, now this is the truth. Right. I'm curious what that signaled to you. When somebody's speaking the truth, they're just conveying information. Somebody who's lying has to then convince you that this lie is true. So you'll get overselling. So the gentleman we just heard from is a retired FBI special agent and profiler by the name of Jim Clemente. He was also a prosecutor in New York and he's there to you know, lend some insight on some of the behaviors. And what he said is dead on. We were touching on this earlier. Some analysts say truth tellers convey, liars convince. I say truth tellers tell, liars sell, but it comes down to the same thing. And here OJ is being asked about how he damaged his finger and he says, really, with an eyebrow flash again. So emphasizing, like, this is, this is really what happened. And then he goes on to say, this is the truth, again, with an eyebrow flash. And we call these perception qualifiers. When we say things like honestly or truthfully or to tell you the truth. Now, caution. Some people regularly talk this way. Everything they say is honestly this, truthfully that, to tell you the truth, I went there, and honestly this and that. OJ doesn't. It's not in the, in the rest of this interview, I don't remember a time where he said it that many times in succession. And all of a sudden we get really, this is the truth. And like really trying to emphasize, oh, this, this is what happened. Okay, so if this is the truth, what isn't the truth? Like you're telling me here, this is the truth. So let's go back and what, what parts of that weren't the truth, right? Now I will play devil's advocate for a quick second. It has been shown that people who fear not being believed often behave the way liars do because they know they're not being believed. And this was a big thing in the trial, the whole how he hurt his fingers. So he knows a lot of people don't believe that. So it could be that he's emphasizing here, this is honest to God truth, this is actually what happened. Like here I'm being truthful. But either way, it's weird that we're getting all of a sudden these perception qualifiers out of nowhere. Because either it's like, okay, that's not true, or okay, this is true, but why do you feel the need to really emphasize that this is true? What isn't? But anyways, look, it's a fascinating and strange interview. And we could dig in more into more clips and I could find more things like perception qualifiers and sudden flutters and pacifying and all the things we normally talk about. But I will not be able to get past that hypothetical segment that does not feel hypothetical. For me, that's the meat of this interview. And I do encourage you to go watch the whole thing because there's a lot of segments about them going into his character a little bit and a lot of other things he does in the interview that it's like, okay, that, that was a weird thing to say there. But for me, just the way that story was told and how it feels like someone recalling something that actually happened with the verb tense, with those slip ups, with things that don't line up with someone recalling a hypothetical from a book. But I would love to know what you think. Is there a possibility that this is actually a hypothetical scenario with some really, really bizarre word choice? My regular reviewers know that I very rarely have an opinion. I point out behaviors for you to reflect on your own position. And as long as you consider the alternative and critically thought about it, I'm a happy guy. I just don't like stubborn polarized thinking. And in this case, I'm trying really, really hard to debate myself and say, okay, well maybe, maybe this is because of that or because this is happening because of this. And this is hypothetical, you know, but I'm just, I'm, I'm having a really hard time seeing it. To me, it just overwhelmingly feels like this is absolutely not hypothetical. But let me know in the comments what you think and I will see you on the next one.